The Second Amendment to the United States Constitution enshrines the right to keep and bear arms and limits the state's ability to restrict that right. One exception that has been recognized in judicial doctrine involves something called sensitive places. Today we'll discuss. Hello and welcome to Talks on Law. I'm Joel Cohen. We're joined remotely by a constitutional scholar, a Second Amendment expert, and the co-director of the Duke Center for Firearms Law, Joseph Bloker. Welcome back to Talks on Law. Thanks so much for having me, Joel. Professor, what do we mean when we talk about sensitive places under the Second Amendment? Well, at a top line, uh, sensitive places are those locations where guns can be prohibited without violating the Second Amendment. They are the sort of locations, if you like, that can be designated gun-free without violating anybody's right to keep and bear arms. And I think one way to just kind of think about them is that you know, gun laws come in lots of different categories. There are laws that restrict who can have weapons, like prohibitions on possession by people who've been convicted of felonies or who've been adjudicated mentally ill. Those are kind of who prohibitions. There are those that restrict the kinds of weapons you can carry. Like the, we can think of those as the what, right? The restriction about high capacity magazines, for example, that some states have. And sensitive places restrictions are the proverbial where, you know, where can you carry your guns? And there are some places that the Supreme Court and lower courts have recognized can be designated gun free. When I think about sensitive places, the first one that comes to mind is an airplane. You're flying around in a metal capsule. Do you really want everyone to have a loaded puncturing device that can uh, immediately depressurize and, and perhaps lead to an early landing? Yeah, I think the answer to that one's no. Uh, that's, a, that's a question I don't have any, um, any doubt saying the answer is no. I mean, the hard questions really are about that one as a good example is like how to justify it. Like what, what are the concerns that make it okay to prohibit, as federal law does, prohibit a loaded gun in an airplane cabin. And there are lots of different kind of underlying reasons we can imagine. You know, it's because they're it's because they're really dangerous. It's because of the cabin is pressurized. And we know what happens if somebody, you know, were to fire a gun and puncture a hole in that flying tube. But uh, Supreme Court cases, some of them seem to take off the table that kind of, if you like, sort of policy-based rationale and direct us back into history. And that makes it a little harder uh, to get around to, like, why is it okay to prohibit guns in airplane cabins? Although, at least from my view, it's not only sensible, but very clearly constitutional. Let's talk about the Supreme Court cases that established this doctrine. First off is the groundbreaking landmark Supreme Court case, District of Columbia v. Heller, a case that you were actually involved with. Yeah. So the case where we get the phrase is District of Columbia versus Heller, which is sort of the foundational case for the modern Second Amendment. And the challenge there didn't actually have to do with any particular location. Um, the, the, the challenger in that case, Dick Heller, just wanted to have a handgun in his home for self-defense. But in the course of recognizing that Heller did have that right, the Supreme Court went on to say, nothing we've decided here should cast any doubt on other longstanding prohibitions, including restrictions on guns in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings. So Heller points to those two, but the case didn't really have to go through any more detail because those, it wasn't really a challenge about those two things. Do you think judges were immediately sensitive to Let's not have guns in the courtroom. <laughs> you know, it's interesting you say that um, because when the Supreme Court came back to the Second Amendment and its next really thorough engagement, which was the 2022 decision in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, it again recognized the legitimacy of locational restrictions, but it gave a slightly different list. So instead of saying schools and government buildings, the majority in Bruin said uh, legislative assemblies, polling places and courthouses, which slightly different, but you know, you, you can imagine maybe that what was on the justices' mind. So again, after Bruin, we know some locational restrictions are okay. Which ones and how we justify them is a little harder. You mentioned Bruin. That was the second case that I was uh, hoping to touch on. Bruin did expand that articulated list of sensitive places, but it did something else. What other impact on Second Amendment sensitive place doctrine did uh, Bruin have? I think the really major thing that Bruin did, and it's true for sensitive places doctrine, just for like lots of other areas of Second Amendment law, was change the methodology. They changed like how we know what gun laws are okay and which ones aren't. So what Bruin said was from now on, the legitimacy of modern gun laws is based on whether they are consistent with historical tradition. 
So in other words, we're not supposed to look directly at things like costs and benefits or maybe even risk. I mean, to go back to your airplane example, right? The arguments that we were talking about there are really arguments about sort of like modern risk, empirical risk. Or common sense. Yeah, yeah common sense is not the test, uh, uh, it, except in as much as it is reflected in historical tradition. Now, the really hard thing is that some of these locations like the airplanes, just didn't exist in 1791. Right. As far-seeing as the Freedmers were in some ways, they really didn't have a conception of manned air flights. Right? That was, just not, that was not, not on their agenda. And so, you know, we're not going to find in 1791 exactly a law restricting guns in airplanes, or for that matter, subways or you know, sports stadiums like daycares, lots of places that we have today where guns might be restricted that didn't exist then. So what we have to do post-Bruin is kind of analogize, like how how are the modern ones relevantly similar to the historical ones? Um, and there are, to be clear, a lot of historical place-based restrictions. We just have to kind of figure out like which ones are, are relevant to the kinds of things we want. We might want to restrict today. Yeah, maybe you could do some some quick Second Amendment jujitsu and <laughs> make the argument based on text, history, and tradition for why guns shouldn't be allowed on airplanes, or at least not loaded guns. Yeah, I mean, so the way I think it will work, and the way we're actually seeing it work out a little bit in lower courts, is that courts are saying, okay, look, it would be a mistake, and Bruin says this, it would be a mistake to look only for a historical twin. It doesn't have to be that there's a long-standing historical law specifically regulating airplanes or subways or daycares or any of those places. What we want to know is, is there a kind of relevantly similar law, right? Maybe a law that had the same purpose or the same basic effect, right? And so what that means is you kind of have to back up a little bit, like a, jump up a level of generality, if you like. Don't look just for airplanes. Look for, you know, what is it about airplanes that we're worried about? You know, what's the, what's the reason underlying the regulation, not just the specific location. And there's lots of different principles that one could draw, and scholars and litigators and courts disagree about this, but I'll just give you a couple. One is some people say sensitive places are those where physical danger is heightened because you have a lot of people together or tempers are high or inhibitions are lowered. You know, you could think about bars, maybe packed sports stadiums, maybe, you know, political assemblies, you know, maybe those kind of fit in that under that principle. So we might be thinking of, you know, the antiquated market square. I'm just trying to think of you know, 1700s life. What would be a particularly dangerous place? This is a great, a great question because actually, you know, as I mentioned, there are a lot of historical place-based restrictions and they reflect, I think, some of these concerns that today to us maybe sound intuitive. So um, Heller, I said, mentioned schools. Well, there are gun prohibitions in schools going back to the mid-17th century uh, in the United States. Another place where there's a lot of restrictions are places having to do with sort of democratic life. Small D. Sorry. Yes, exactly. Small, small D Democrat. Um, but, you know, people's participation in, in public life. Um, uh, my co-author, Reva Siegel of Yale Law School, and I have been working on this in sort of some recent scholarship coming out in the, the NYU Law Review. But one of the things we try to illustrate and other historians have shown is that if you go back to consider um, legislative assemblies and polling places, uh, and for that matter, government buildings, you'll find restrictions again from the 17th century onwards. And the concern that seemed to animate them was exactly the risk of both violence and intimidation. Now, what kind of violence and intimidation has changed? You know, at the late 1700s, it was, you know, loyalists against revolutionaries in the context of the Revolutionary War. In Reconstruction, it was white supremacists against black Americans. Like, there are different ways in which guns near polling places can harm. And today, maybe we have different kinds of concerns about people who patrol polling places with guns. But it's the same kind of concern that I think can apply in a lot of other context. And so that's the kind of reasoning I guess I think one should do, which is like figure out the underlying reasons and then see if those map on to more modern places. I kind of love the idea of you sitting at your office reading laws from the 1700s. Is this what you thought your career would be like when you were when you were in law school back in the day? It's really not. And sometimes I look up and look out the window. I'm like, what is going on? What am I doing? This feels so far removed from like the actual both like, I guess, costs and benefits of gun use today. Uh, and in, in talking to historians, I think they often have the same reaction, like, what are we doing? But I will say, I mean, with regard to these historical restrictions, 
We at Duke host something called the Repository of Historical Gun Laws, which is a free online collection of historical gun regulations. I was just looking at it yesterday, and there are more than 150 sensitive place restrictions in there. So if anybody else gets the bug and wants to sit and flip through some old laws, uh, you can flip through and see, oh, you know, they restricted guns, at, you know, within a half mile of a polling place in Texas and Louisiana in the late 1800s. And, you know, the historical context of that might be interesting. Is a trial of witches a sensitive place? Yeah, I would expect so, right? Whether or not it happens in a courthouse, uh, to your earlier to your earlier question, I would suspect that that's the answer. But but again, I mean, the, to phrase the question, I think, is to capture what is so hard about doing this kind of analogy post Bruin. I mean, there are pending challenges as you and I are talking in the spring of 2023 pending challenges to the prohibition of guns on the D.C. metro, on the subway in New York, uh, and judges are trying to evaluate those laws by reference to 1791 or 1868, which I think for a lot of us is just kind of like a mind-bending way to think about constitutional law when I think both the challengers and the defenders are really more interested in does this respect my right to keep and bear arms? And does this respect public safety? Like, it's just very disconnected from what I think most people feel like are the real stakes. You know, the thing about this particular topic, a lot of gun law, gun rights, gun regulation issues, which is just the same thing that makes the sensitive place dangerous to carry a gun is the same reason why you might want to carry one for your own protection. Could you speak to that? It's, I think you're, it's really, really important to emphasize that. It is true broad, more broadly, I think, in the sort of gun rights and regulation debate. That's sort of like, sometimes called like the awful symmetry of this, because it is, um, you know, the very same things that make handguns good for self-defense, make them an attractive tool for would-be criminals, right? The very thing that might make a place sensitive, if we're thinking about in terms of dangerousness, that is dangerous and then subject to gun prohibition is also the reason that some gun owners might want to carry their guns in. So the question kind of becomes, well, how can you break that symmetry, right? Is there a way to preserve people's sense of security while also disarming them when they enter into a particular place? And there are various solutions to this. Um, one that many proponents of broad gun rights put forward is, okay, you can disarm people only in those places where the government has taken on a kind of increased um, uh, security role. So, for example, uh, Justice Alito raised this at the oral argument in the Bruin case, places where there's magnetometers, right, where you have to walk through the metal detector, right? That might explain why courthouses are okay uh, for guns to be prohibited, because the government has ensured that everybody's disarmed. Maybe that works for sports stadiums and things like that. But it wouldn't explain necessarily a national park, right, or other kinds of places, some of which are designated uh, as, uh, as gun-free zones. And I think a lot of gun owners also say, look, um, why should I have to sacrifice my right to keep and bear arms when I enter into a place to exercise some other constitutional right? So polling places are an example, right? People have a fundamental right to keep and bear arms and a fundamental right to vote, why should they have to trade one to be able to exercise the other? And I think there's like an intuitive appeal to that argument. I do think it is limited in terms of its actual payoff. Um, you know, you have a fundamental right to engage in political speech as well, but you can't do that in a polling place. That's what anti-electioneering laws are about. I mean, you have a fundamental right to engage in consensual sex with another an adult. You can't do that in a polling booth either, right? There are some times and places where gun rights versus other rights can be exercised, right? And so I think the trade-off argument only gets us, uh, only gets us uh, so far. You could certainly apply that on the other side, the other direction where, you know, I have a fundamental right to interstate travel. So I do want to carry my long rifle on the, on the airplane. I think that's right. And this is another part, I think, where post-Bruin, I think we're going to really see a lot of focus, which is what happens when you take a lot of individual sensitive places, each of which is valid, and you aggregate them in a place like, let's say, Manhattan, where they might be all close to one another? So I think many people, if not the vast majority, think it's permissible to prohibit guns in schools, right? And maybe government buildings, since Heller already said that. If you take Manhattan or Washington, D.C., and you put all the schools and the government buildings and maybe put a little buffer around each of them and call all of those sensitive, that's a lot of those cities. Um, and if you're a gun owner trying to kind of navigate your way through a city, it may be kind of a patchwork of places where you can carry your guns. And that may, be, that may feel like it is like a real burden for the gun owner.
So the tricky question kind of comes like, well, which one gives way there? You know, like if each of these things individually is permissible, what do we do when they all happen to be kind of, you know, closely designated? One thing I, I will say that Bruin tells us, and I think is sensible, is that a city can't designate all of itself as a sensitive place. Like New York City cannot say, we are as a whole a sensitive place. The sensitive places inquiry is a little more fine grained than that. But the, the, I guess the challenge I'm trying to put on the table is like, what happens when the individual sensitive places add up to basically all of, a, all of the city? Joseph Bloker is a professor of law at Duke Law School and the co-director of the Duke Center for Firearms Law. Joseph, it is always a pleasure. So nice talking to you today. Thanks so much, Joel.